Hello and welcome to Moving Kentucky Forward. I'm Bruce Maples, publisher of Forward Kentucky. As you know, if you've been following our site for a while, you know that I write regularly, we post regularly about the climate crisis and what it means for our country, our world, and our state. Recently, we did a series of articles on the risk by county of the various kinds of changes that are coming from the climate crisis. That was based on data from the First Street Foundation, which has done an amazing job of gathering and putting out data that's easy to understand and use. So we did a series of maps on the four types of risks. I thought it would be interesting to interview one of the people from First Street Foundation. So today we're going to talk to Dr. Jeremy Porter, who is one of the scientists that works at the First Street Foundation and who has been very gracious in sharing their data with us. Let's hear from Dr. Jeremy Porter. So we're here today with Dr. Jeremy Porter, who is with the First Street Foundation. Dr. Porter, welcome to Moving Kentucky Forward. Hey, thanks, Bruce. I'm, I'm glad to be on. We are glad to have you. Uh, your team's work was impressive. And as you know, we ran a series of stories about the risk that climate change presents to the state. Why don't you, before we get into the meat of the questions, why don't you take a moment to explain to our viewers and listeners what First Street Foundation is? Yeah, so the First Street Foundation, we've been around for about seven years, and we're really a collective of communication experts and scientists that came together to try to address the issue of, of making climate science accessible and, and presenting it in a way that individuals could understand their 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 risk. You know, when we first started, even seven or eight years ago, the the term climate, you know, it's divisive. As soon as you say it, you turn off half the people and the other half the people are, you know, right behind you. Uh, one of the ways that we really focused on and communicating this type of information was to make it tangible to people. You know, we don't talk about, you know, what's causing the change in the in the climate. What we say what we talk about is the additional water that's in the street or you know the additional uh, uh days of heat indices above a certain threshold uh, of dangerous days so we're really focused on actual observation and and communicating that observation to people in a way that's really tangible and accessible to them excellent uh what's been the response to that approach um folks have been pretty responsive and we we you know we've gotten uh, a lot of positive responses from all the way from late individuals that go on to our riskfactor.com site, they type in their address and they they look at their own risk and you know though they they maybe aren't in a FEMA zone or they didn't know that they were in a FEMA flood zone and now they can see their own property uh with really easy to understand statistics about their risk today and how their risk may change moving into the future. But even beyond you know your average user of that that site, uh the federal government has has been in conversations with us about starting to integrate some of this information into their own work industry has reached out because you know they're, they're, this data exists the problem is that this type of work exists in scientific journals which really isn't accessible mm -hmm. uh, to most people even 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 you know really really smart people sometimes can't get into the climate science it's in some of those uh journal articles so they folks have really been responsive to the fact that we're we're we're, take, we're making the effort to communicate it in a way that's easy to understand uh, not that I'm trying to call us out as something special, but have mm -hmm. any other states or publications done state-specific stories? Um, you, the the story that came out of out of your publication, and especially the multi uh, the kind of the multi-report approach around the different climate perils, it has been pretty unique. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it is uh, um, you know really focused on the state. It's presenting local information to local residents in a way that that matters. And it really helps to amplify kind of our goal of getting this information out into the hands of people when we can work with folks that can also disseminate the information locally, and they have a medium already set up to do that. So without going into uh, apocalyptic literature, mm -hmm. uh, how bad is the risk we are facing as, and you can put it on any level you want, nation, mm -hmm. world, whatever. Um, we, it, it's hard to say, you know, when we first started doing this work seven or again, seven or eight years ago, a lot of the, even the scientific literature was really forward facing. It was saying, 
you know, what is climate change going to look like in 2100? And that, you know, that was primarily the way in which you heard people talk about climate change. Uh, we we started really taking an approach of focusing on what's already happened. So our, the first thing that we've ever done is we, we first thing we ever did is we created a scientific peer reviewed study around uh, property value impacts from tidal flooding. You know, tidal flooding happens on sunny days. It's relatively low impact, but it ends up, you know, flooding the streets multiple times uh, a year in coastal communities. And people were, were starting to see that as a nuisance. They were, you know, it was happening all the time. It was happening more often. It was inundating roads and they were trapped in their homes for, you know, four or five hours on a weekend or something like that. So all, the, all of a sudden you started to see actual signals in property valuations where properties weren't becoming less uh, valuable, but they weren't appreciating as fast as properties that had the exact same characteristics in the exact same neighborhoods, but weren't inundated by flooding. So you, we, we started to take that approach where we could say, all right, this is already happening. Uh, we can see it in the last 15 or 20 years worth of data. But I really think that we're at the very beginning point of that. A lot of the develop development that we've done over the last you know half century, especially in the last half of the 1900s, was done in areas that were were really safe at the time. They, they weren't, they didn't have the same type of climate risk mm -hmm. that we have today. And now we're starting to see this intersection of increased climate risk, whether it be wind, wildfire, heat, flood, and where we've chosen to develop and where, where our cities have grown and where people have have uh, sort of developed uh, communities over you know the last 50 to 70, 50 to 70 years or so. And I think we're in the very beginning stages of that intersection, which is why it's become such a uh, a big issue because people are being impacted by these types of climate events in a way that you know they were in the past, but it just wasn't quite as frequent, and you weren't seeing these climate change signals uh, in the data the way that we are today. We only project out thirty years, and we only do that. We do that for a couple of reasons. One, it it it's tangible to people. A lot of a lot of folks, when we're trying to message this, we tell them what the risk is to their property, to their uh, home where they live. That's generally the the length of a mortgage in the U.S. mortgage market. So it gives mm. people something to think about when they're thinking about you know their property or buying a property. But also the global climate models as you project out into the future, after about thirty years, they go all over the place. You know, there's there's five or six of them that are kind of the main trajectories. And, you know, you can follow one that is apocalyptic. I think to your point, some of the other ones basically say things will stay the same. We're not going to see much difference. But if you only go out about 30 years, they're in pretty good agreement. And they they tend to say that really no matter what we do at this point, we're baked in to the next 30 years. So if we just go out and look that far out, we can see that there are clear climate signals. It, 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 temperature is going to increase. We're going to see more flood events. We're going to see more extreme precipitation events. Uh, we're already seeing more drought and wildfire uh, out west. Hurricanes are becoming stronger and, and bringing stronger wind events to the Gulf Coast and the uh, southeast of East Atlantic coast. And, and we're starting to see that move upwards. Kentucky isn't quite yet being affected by uh, extreme wind events from hurricanes, although you know tornadoes and other types of, of uh, wind events certainly happen. Uh, in the state, so we're 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 seeing an increase in all of those um, different climate hazards. I think the biggest correction in our work so far has been just getting people to understand what the risk is today, because we we haven't really taken it into account up up until today. And then understanding that that once you correct for today's climate, it's going to continue to to get worse in in certain areas for for certain hazards. I think it's interesting that. Um... One commentator recently said, hope you are enjoying the coolest summer you will have mm -hmm. in the rest of your life, uh, which I thought was an interesting way to put it. So we have, uh, I follow uh, one YouTuber who was talking about climate change. And it's interesting because he's not exactly, um, he's not exactly a climate scientist. He sort of covers a lot of ground. But he made a comment recently that if you have a candidate running for office, particularly a state or federal office, and they don't have a climate plan, a plan to deal with climate change, they're not worth your vote. They don't deserve your vote. What do you say to that comment? Uh, I think that that's becoming increasingly relevant. I think that over over time, again, since we've really been doing this for early on, it was hard to get climate on people's agenda. You know, usually politicians have one or two core things that they're going to run on. They're going to focus all their time on that, push that out to their constituents. Folks are more and more 
interested in in adding climate to that. It's becoming a, an increasingly relevant topic across the country. Uh, all all countries are, are all all parts of the country are impacted uh, uh, regionally. There may be different uh, climate events that that impact different parts of the country, but all of them tend to be climate climate related. So if you don't have a plan for you know, not not even necessarily mitigation and decreasing carbon emissions and things like that. But if you at the baseline, if you just have a plan for protecting the residents in your community, mm -hmm. you know, building uh, um, seawalls or you know putting up levees or installing pumps for flooding or uh, fire suppression out west. So there 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 are all these different things that uh, property owners really can't do. They have to be community actions. And it's really a it really is important that the community leaders understand that it's their their job to be able to protect their communities from these growing climate risks. One of the questions I raised with we're going to have a govern a governor's race this year, and uh, I sent a message to the lady who will uh, moderate one of them, and I said, "Don't let them off the hook about climate." Uh, one of them basically denies that climate change exists. The other one has an energy policy, but not, so, not necessarily a climate risk policy. So I'm hoping they will address that. I have a question. I'm, I'm a little bit of a statistics nerd. Um, mm -hmm. And as such, I hate averages. I think averages are usually useless. Yeah. So, But I want to know how to express something. So let's take Western Kentucky, which is a mm -hmm. large agricultural area. And as you know, they are uh, at increased risk for heat. Um, but I think they're also at risk of drought and flood and so on and so forth. If we have uh, three weeks of drought and two days of heavy rain, the average may be uh, the same as normal, but obviously it's not. How can you show that in a graph or in some sort of explanation so people can understand that we're dealing with extremes? Yeah, that, that's a really good point. I mean, it, we're seeing that out in California right now. Also, you make the point around Western uh, Kentucky where, you know, these prolonged periods of drought put a lot of stress on the water supply. And, you know, what we, it, it, over those even three weeks, we're going to ha have to tap in the water to keep crops uh, alive so the agricultural industry doesn't end up uh, sort of succumbing to those heat waves and those patterns that exist. We may get uh, two extreme uh, precipitation events, you know, that that maybe are back to back or on on the bookends of that of that drought. And you're right when you take the average, you'll say, well, we had a regular year, we had an average year of, of rainfall, so we shouldn't have. There's no climate change. There's nothing to worry about. It looks like it normally looks like. The problem is, is to, directly to your point on precipitation is we're not getting really more rain year over year across the country, even in the places that we're seeing more flooding from rainfall, we're getting it all at one time. So we're having these extreme mm. precipitation events that are occurring and the, the ground just can't soak up the water uh, in the same way that it could if it was evenly spread across the entire, uh, across the entire year or across the entire rainy season. So what we end up seeing is flooding and runoff and uh, issues like that, that that don't necessarily speak to the amount of rainfall that, you know, an industry in agriculture in Western Kentucky would actually need to be able to be viable and to be able to be uh, to supply, you know, the the, the food and crops and, and things like that to keep the farmers in business uh, in that area. So when you have these extremes, you end up on both sides of, of either whether it be heat and drought or whether it be precipitation, not actually getting what you need for the ideal conditions for that industry uh, to thrive, even though if we couple it all together, the average makes it seem like it's business as usual in those areas. So is there a way to show that statistically or graphically? Is there mm -hmm. some sort of explanation? I'm thinking to myself of yeah. uh, variable... I don't know, something that you could put up there and say, this is what a normal summer looks like. This is what your summer is going to look like. Yeah, a lot, a lot of folks will focus in on like 98th percentile events or 90th percentile events. So you're really looking at the tail. And we, we know, well, we, you know, there had to be some type of context around that. We know that these types of events bring flooding or these types of events kill crops. Uh, and if we can show that there's an increase in those 90th percentile events or those mm -hmm. events on the end of the distributional tail, 
then we're kind of telling the story that the the extreme events are happening more often than they're associated with these negative events. The the, the one other thing that we're really working on, uh, kind of building out at this point, as you know, we're we're adding or you know we have all these different climate perils. They're kind of standalone um, perils. We're we're working on correlated risk and trying to understand you know what happens if there is a uh, a wildfire and then there's a flood right after it. All of a sudden, yeah. you have all this ground that that you know uh isn't as stable as it used to be you have a flood and then you have landslides mudslides all these types of things associated with it so there are these compounding risks that occur if you take into account kind of these extreme events in correlated form i've been thinking that one way to talk about uh the agriculture issue in western kentucky which is really on my mind uh mm -hmm. is we're going to have to start farming like egyptians in the nile valley I mean, when the water's there, you got to store it somehow, mm -hmm. somewhere, and then be able to use it later. Yeah. Are you getting any traction with government officials with your work? Are you having elected officials talk to you, come to your site, take action based on your uh, work or anything like that? We, yeah, yeah, it, it's funny because we're, we are getting some traction with some folks. We, we've been up to the, to DC. We gave testimony to the Senate. Uh, with Sheldon Whitehouse, he, he's a he's a big proponent of our work, but he's also a big climate person. He's a Democrat that really enjoy, you know is behind climate. Uh, we we haven't quite seen kind of the mainstream politicians, people that aren't already doing that kind of work, um, you know, dig in and and take our work in, in a way that they've made public. Uh, a lot of states like South Carolina, for instance, uh, we work with them directly. Uh, in their Office of Resilience, they're building a tool using our risk factor tool to communicate risk to residents in the state of South Carolina. And the state of Illinois also is doing the same thing. So it, it, it's not necessarily politicians in particular, but government offices uh, at the state level have been have been reaching out and been thinking about smart ways of using the data and, and uh, the, the sort of ease of communication to to pass this information along to 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 their constituents. Are you doing any work around mitigation solutions? It's one thing to point out the risk. It's another thing to say, like I just said a few minutes ago, okay, here's what you need to be doing. Do you do any work around that or is it just pointing out the risk? It's primarily risk based. We we like we feel like there's a there's a large pipeline of this work, and we plug into a specific area of the pipeline. And our 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 goal is really to produce high resolution, high quality, peer reviewed scientific models that other people can take and make make decisions, uh, uh, make decisions around. You know, when when folks reach out to us and they ask us, you know, about uh, maybe a flood model and where, you know, how, how do we use this to understand where we should allocate resources for mitigation or adaptation? You know, we can give them some ideas around around the topic, but we really just see ourselves as data providers. So let me go back to something you said a little while ago. You said that based on the model, you only go out 30 years because that's mm -hmm. where most of the models agree. And you made the comment that Pretty much no matter what we do, the change is baked in. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. So there, there, there are dozens of these global climate models that project out into the future, usually out to about 2100. And then there are, are sort of these five different uh, pathways, which are like, which are uh, kind of considered the main uh, pathways forward. There's a, a really conservative pathway in regard to what we might do. Uh, in regard to reducing greenhouse emissions and things like that, which essentially says that we're not going to make much change. Uh, we're 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 going to essentially be on the same pathway moving into the future, and, and you know, there's this upward trajectory. There's others that are really, uh, really highlight the fact that we could, you know, everybody could be driving an electric vehicle, and you know, there there are different ways of of kind of mitigating some of these carbon emissions, and it has a much uh, shallower slope into the future. So what, what we do is you know, we end up taking all of those those global climate models from the National Climate Assessment from the U.S. Uh, government. And when you look at them there, no matter which trajectory you look at out to about 30 years, the error bars on all of them overlap. They're all really tightly clustered with one another. So that that essentially says that business as usual or everybody adopting electric vehicles and so forth, we're kind of going to be in the same place 
in 30 years. But after that, you start to see that deviation on those those climate models to the point to where, you know, the ones where we adapt uh, the most quickly, we actually see a decrease. It's not, it not you know, it's not a dramatic decrease to get back to where we were 20 or 30 years ago, but we're not increasing uh, carbon emissions anymore either. So there, there, there is kind of this baked in pattern out to about 30 years. I was interested in a statistic I heard recently, and I don't remember, frankly, if it was from your side or from somewhere else, that climate events that cause more than a billion dollars of damage mm -hmm. in today's dollars, so you can go back to past events and and you know adjust the numbers to reflect today's dollars, climate mm -hmm. events that cause more than a billion dollars in damage used to occur in the United States once every 80 days which I was shocked that it didn't seem to me that that was, I didn't really remember it being that frequent, but okay. And they said that today it's once every 18 days. Mm -hmm. And that statistic just blew me away. That was like, wow, that's a, so to your point about the 95th percentile events, mm -hmm. uh, that certainly sounds like that. Would yeah. you call yourself an optimist, a pessimist? How would you describe your approach to this work? Um, I, 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 as a scientist, I would probably say an empiricist. I, I really focus on, you know, the data, what we've seen uh, up to this point. I think that getting, uh, we really, we're really, uh, we really get behind the idea of kind of democratizing the data and making mm -hmm. sure that the stuff that we pay for as taxpayers for the federal government to produce, we can repurpose and we can use that data that, that, that already exists. The best scientists in the world are working at NASA and they're working at FEMA and they're working at the USGS. And they have all this data and all these findings that just doesn't get communicated clearly uh, to individuals. So we, we like to take that information and understand, you know, what's happening already and how can we tell this story to people in a way that they can understand. I would say then I'm probably an optimist. I think that if we tell the story the right way to people, people will respond. I think you can kind of get beyond uh, some of the political orientations and the pushback that you that you receive from folks if you're you know, focusing on observation and you're focusing on water industries and you're focusing on communities. If you tell someone their community is at risk of, you know, flooding uh, you know, 10 times more often than 30 years, it doesn't really matter what your orientation is at that point. You're going to say, well, I want to protect my community and I want my political leader to protect my community. So that, that I think, uh, both an empiricist and an optimist potentially. <laughs> mm. Well, that's good because you're a balance to me because I'm... <laughs> relatively pessimistic about the whole thing because i mm -hmm. i don't see our elected officials really mm -hmm. being serious about it for the most part if you were me and you had this little site in kentucky what would you be doing in terms of getting the word out i ran the series and it it got some traction and i'll probably push it to some people but what else could i be doing or what else could all of us be doing yeah, um, I th it, it, we're we're one source of data. I think you know, coupling that with other other information is really powerful. We we always say that we you know we want people to use our data to make decisions for their own you know personal property and for their communities. But understand what you know the, your your local government is telling you. Also, understand what FEMA is telling you. Understand what some of these other organizations are telling you. I think the biggest problem. Uh, that that we've seen so far, though, is that when you when you focus on uh, a, you know the national story, or even a lot of the national climate climate assessments and global climate assessments are so broad that they you know that that, that was a problem with the science you know uh, 10, 15 years ago. Nobody you know it didn't mean anything to anybody. Two degrees of increasing temperature is catastrophic if you actually understand the risk uh, in Celsius. But if you just hear two degrees as a regular person, you're going to be like, well. You know, the, the temperature fluctuates 20 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, every day at least. So there's this uh, there's this, this lack of understanding around uh, what, is, what is actually happening. I think drilling down like you're doing to the state level, to the county level, and then to the degree that we're able to, to the property level. So we, you know, the, the risk factor stuff that we put together, I think that's where we get the most traction with people. We get the most eyes on our um, on our data. And we, you know, we integrated in with with other 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 folks that are interested in the same thing on their site, so that that the data comes in in a way that you know people are really really digging in and understanding their own their own personal risk. You know, it could could be something like 
zip codes even even that's super relevant to people that's like their neighborhood or their community essentially so if you were going to encapsulate your work mm -hmm. in a headline what would that headline be the headline to me would be that um the climate change is already impacting uh individuals and it's only going to continue to get worse moving into the future okay uh, i think but, that super broad <laughs> well but but that's a, you know the fact that it's yes. only going to get worse says yeah. okay we need to be doing something uh sure. do you are you are you able or people on your team able to give uh virtual testimony to elected officials and to councils and things like that we yeah we do we do engage uh with with government officials to the to the degree that we're able to we actually on our on our staff uh our chief data officer uh, was at the federal government for 10 years before coming here mm -hmm. he was the chief data officer at NOAA and at the US Department of Commerce and he he has a lot of those types of connections and he you know he's constantly trying to get in touch with folks at uh FEMA or folks at the USGS or uh the, the department of treasury or any of these other groups that'll listen to them uh so that you know we can we can get the data into a place where people can use it to make decisions and they you mm. know they can make the decision that makes the most sense for them but we just want people to have access to what we believe is really high resolution high quality data so is there anything that you wanted to talk about that i haven't asked you um i I think I snuck it in a little bit a couple of times. We're, we're a nonprofit organization. And, you know, so our goal is really to quantify and communicate risk to individuals. So we, you know, we created that riskfactor.com site. Uh, anybody can go on, type in their address and understand their own personal risk. We are, we do have heat, flood, uh, wildfire and wind risk on there now. We're building out a air quality product. Mm -hmm. uh, primarily around ozone and PM25 or smoke from wildfires. And then we're also going to add a drought product into the into the suite of, of uh, climate perils. So those should be ready probably the middle, uh, the middle of next year or so. But the last thing I, I would kind of add on is is you know when we first created a lot of these hazard models, you know we went out, we told people about it. People were really interested to see property specific climate risk. But then a lot of folks would come back and they'd say, uh, so there's two feet of water to my building and a one in a hundred year storm. You know what what does that actually mean for me is it is it going to go away and i'm not going to have much damage or you know can you quantify the economic costs of some of these things so we're, we're really focused now also on thinking about the implications of some of these climate hazards so the, the ag space that you talked about earlier is huge ramifications for agriculture and in the climate space uh property damages uh, associated with wind risks uh, associated with uh, extreme precipitation events. My, I think I mentioned to you before, my mother lives in Louisville and she's had her roof torn off twice, uh, not the whole roof, but shingles and parts of the roof torn off from recent wind events over the last year. So there, there, you know, there are these types of, of risks that, that, that impact, that end up impacting, uh, personal properties and they're, they're much more tangible when you can tell people and you're annually, you can expect to spend X amount of dollars on climate risk, and that just becomes part of your cost of home ownership. I read one person who said that in the end, it will be the insurance companies who force everybody to deal with this. Mm. I thought that was an interesting comment. Yes. Let's be sure that everybody knows the site. It is risk factor, R I S K F A C T O R dot com. And you can go there and put in your address or put in your zip code or whatever and uh, find out what risk you're at from climate change. Dr. Jeremy Porter with First Street Foundation. Uh, thank you so much for talking with us. And uh, when you come to see your mom in Louisville, uh, let me know and I'll buy you some coffee. Perfect. I'm a proud graduate of the University of Louisville also. So I'm, uh, I'm happy to do this. Yeah. Go Cards. No cards. <laughs> All right. Thank you for your time. And uh, we will be talking more about your work. Thanks, Bruce. I appreciate it. That was Dr. Jeremy Porter of the First Street Foundation. I want to thank him and his colleagues for sharing their data with us so that we could do our series on the risks of climate change in the state of Kentucky. I want to be sure that you remember 
the website that he mentioned, which is riskfactor.com, R-I-S-K-F-A-C-T-O-R.com. You can go to that site, put in your actual street address, and get a report for your specific location in terms of the four types of risks that he talked about. I hope you will go to the website and read the series on climate change. And once again, thanks to the First Street Foundation people for allowing us to use their work. That's all for today, and we'll see you next week.